We're going to hear from Ken Jenkins. <clears throat> Ken, um, as I said, is a, a, a video producer, has a degree in electrical engineering from Carnegie Mellon, and has done extensive postgraduate work in psychology. <clears throat> um, Ken is a, is a, has been a, a pioneer in the 9-11 Truth Movement. Um, Ken started presenting his PowerPoint and video productions on 9-11 in early 2002, Ken was way ahead of the curve, at least compared to me, and has, um, has since produced at least six national 9-11 conferences. His first video, Perspectives on 9-11, was originally made for those early presentations. Ken has produced 10 DVDs um, with leading 9-11 Truth author David Ray Griffin, including 9-11, The Myth and the Reality, which is really an incredible DVD. Um, he also produced, directed, and edited um, our architect Richard Gage's 9-11 Blueprint for Truth. He founded 9-11 TV, 9-11 TV.org, which has documented speakers from many 9-11 conferences and events by revealing the false flag nature of 9-11 attacks. It is Ken's intention not only to help end the current bogus war on terror, <clears throat> but to also open the way to ending war as a political option on this planet. <clears throat> Welcome, Ken. Thank you all for being here today. Um, it's nice to be back in Portland. My last time was when David Ray Griffin was touring uh, Seattle, Portland, and Ashland, uh, w doing the talk that became uh, Let's, the Let's Get Empirical DVD that I produced. And uh, it's great to be back. The um, the title of today's event is What Really Happened and Why It Matters, and uh, Richard Gage clearly covered the what really happened well in terms of the towers. I'll be talking a little bit more about why it matters. And that particular part of the title came from this book, which I recommend um, about JFK. We are at the 50th anniversary of, of that event, and uh, this is one of the best books uh, written on the topic. So in terms of why it matters, uh, Richard covered that and does in this film, I'll just review quickly a few of the reasons that uh, the events of 9-11 are so crucial to our times and our world. Uh, and of course starts with endless wars. Um, there are best estimates over a million dead as a result of the 9-11 wars in Afghanistan and Iraq and elsewhere and counting. And many millions more displaced from their homes, particularly in Iraq. Best estimate. Hello. Um, yeah, roughly uh, four and a half trillion dollars wasted on wars so far. Meanwhile, our economy and infrastructure are both in crisis. Loss of our civil liberties uh, is just, uh, it's ongoing. The Bill of, right of uh, Rights is basically in tatters. We live in an ever-increasing police state. Uh, we've got the Patriot Act, Military Commissions Act, Department of Homeland Security, TSA, and most recently, of course, we've been hearing about the NSA and what they've been doing for a long time. And as has also been pointed out, we're actually less safe as a result of these various wars and actions. Every civilian killed in, uh, uh, overseas means more enemies and more reason for more terrorism. And there's a good film out now I recommend, it's in, actually in theaters, called Dirty Wars, which uh, makes that case rather well. 
And if you're concerned about the environment and, and uh, of the earth, uh, you probably know that wars are probably the single worst, uh, biggest disaster for our environment. So there's many, many reasons to be concerned about 9-11 and, and uh, what really happened. So it's not uh, something of dead history, as a few people will claim. Now, I've been giving these talks uh, now since 2004. This is a new version. And one of the things that I like to emphasize is the power of the 9-11 issue. Uh, and I use this quote from Archimedes, uh, give me a lever long enough and a place to stand, I will move the world. And it's my belief that 9-11 is one of the strongest levers or opportunities of our time and that the truth of 9-11 is already changing our world and will continue to. And that thus it's an unprecedented opportunity uh, to basically bust the war game as it's been played for thousands of years in such a way that we move towards an era of lasting peace where wars no longer dominates humanity. 9-11 truth, a powerful path to peace. So a few years ago, uh, up where I live in, uh, down where I live in the uh, San Francisco Bay Area, I gave a series of three talks uh, that were uh, on three parts, three aspects of the 9-11 uh, questions. And I started off with a basic uh, sort of facts. Hold on. Thank you. Thank you. And I started with um, some of the basic facts as outlined by this particular card that I designed with a team of people to um, just put into my DVDs and to be a handout. And then uh, I f the second part of the series was more what we're going to hear about more of today. Overcoming the Barriers to 9-11 Truth was the title I gave it. And those familiar with the alternative story of the events of 9-11 know that a lack of evidence is not the main limiting factor in spreading the truth of 9-11. Many people don't want to believe scary stuff like that revealed by the 9-11 Truth Movement. This talk primarily looks at such psychological resistances to 9-11 Truth so we can better understand and overcome them. Now we saw a preview of that just a few minutes ago and I will be covering some of that same ground but a lot of other aspects as well. More recently, uh, in 2009 I believe, I wrote an article based on the talks I'd been giving on this topic and a lot of my talk is now going to be structured based on the article I wrote. So I did the PowerPoint, I made the article, now the article informs the PowerPoint. It was written for this magazine, which uh, for the 13th and final edition of a Global Outlook, which was for many years the, the magazine of the 9-11 Truth Movement and is still available. And the article I wrote is available for free download at my website, which is 9-11 TV. And then the third part of that particular series uh, that I gave, I tried to put 9-11 in context and the description for that talk basically read, using the 9-11 truth issue as a touchstone, this discussion will look at the nature of the overall changes we are going through, changes that include other unsettling realities, including stolen elections, multiple lies that deceived us into the war in Iraq, the response to, by FEMA to Katrina, the economic meltdown and big bank bailouts, the list goes on. By seeing all these events in the context of a global awakening that we're all a part of, we can be more effective in our, uh, in our, as activists. And I suggest pr focusing primarily on the specific issues that have the most leverage to facilitate this evolutionary process. And 9-11 for me is number one. And in that particular talk, the one part that I'll include today uh, is a brief excerpt from this book by David Corton called The Great Turning, From Empire to Earth Community. 
And even though in that book he gets 9-11 uh, as the official story, we can excuse him because the rest of the book is really quite superb and I'll be doing a quote from that later in this talk. So, 9-11, was it a psychological operation? Yes. So, what is a PSYOP or a psychological operation? It's a term by, used by the military and secret services, like the CIA, to describe a class of operations that are intended to manipulate the emotions of population. In other words, it's a form of mind control. The specific intention, or a specific intention, of the 9-11 PSYOP, or psychological operation, was to terrorize the American people into supporting the so-called War on Terror, which is a replacement for the Cold War. It's a blank check to attack anyone, anywhere, anytime they want to benefit the U.S. Empire and the banksters, the big central banks that profit from all wars. So when we talk about psychological operations, we're talking in part about public relations or the PR industry. And we can't talk about the PR industry without mentioning uh, Edward Bernays a legendary mind control pioneer and one of the founders of the public relations industry, who is a nephew of the father of psychology, psychiatry, Sigmund Freud. He said, this is a quote from Edward Bernays, if we understand the mechanisms and motives of the group mind, it is now possible to control and regiment the masses according to our will and without their knowing it. Those who manipulate this unseen mechanism of society constitute an invisible government, which is the true ruling power of the country. And it is they who pulls the, pull the wires that control the public mind. Pretty significant statement. So the next part of my talk is going to be based, as I mentioned earlier, primarily on this article. And I'll be pulling excerpts, uh, little chunks of it, up on the screen. I don't expect you to read uh, most of those off the, ex off the uh, text from the article. I have slides that the article was made uh, from that we'll, I'll work from in terms of uh, talking about the various issues. So it really basically comes down to that people don't want to believe 9-11 truth. And I just heard about this particular um, poster from a act, New York activist uh, the day that I was packing to leave and managed to get into the PowerPoint. I thought it was, uh, spoke so well. Uh, the White House lied to us about 9-11. Would you want to know? And the truth is, many people don't yet. So what do I need, mean by want? It is a psychological term, so I'm going to define it a little bit. Want means, amongst other things, desire. Things we want are things we desire. Also includes preferences and particularly motivations. The psychology is all about motivation and desires, and, and uh, so the word want is referring to that. There's also this thing called drives, and drives are um, a part of our psychological makeup and are relevant particularly in, as defined in a system called the Enneagram, which I recommend you check out, uh, describing nine personality drives that uh, drive number six about safety and security, and that is the issue uh, that's most jeopardized by 9-11 um, and the, uh, the rationalization that the government gives us if it's always about national security. These are basic fundamental drives also outlined by Abraham Maslow in his hierarchy of needs. The first, first of the needs is survival and safety and security. So these are very primal, powerful, unconscious drives and needs. So you heard a little bit in the film clips uh, some quotes from people and I want to um, give you my favorite and a few others that I included in the article. Uh, this is a quote from a fellow that was given about a 20 minute download of some of our best information on the demolitions and the stand down and so forth. And he was being very serious, this is not a joke, when he said, I wouldn't believe that even if it was true. And it's, it is kind of funny. It's such a sort of illogical. It doesn't make sense. It's irrational. What it is is emotional. What he's basically saying is, I don't want to believe this. I don't. It's, I'm uncomfortable with it. It disturbs me, and I just simply refuse to believe. 
And here are a few other quotes that are uh, also in my article. As long as my wife and kids are fine and we can live the lifestyle we have, the truth is I don't really care what happened on 9-11. Just kind of a statement of apathy. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Another one, I would not want to live in a world where such a thing could be true. Another, you can't expect someone to listen to information that turns their world upside down. And yet another, I'm not sure I want to know. If this was true, then down would be, up would be down, or excuse me, up would be down and down would be up. My life would never be the same. And yet another, look, I have to admit that I seriously resist anyone messing with my worldview. A little hostility there. Um, so these are real quotes from real people presented with the 9-11 issue. So clearly there's a lot of psychological resistance. So briefly, one of the biggest psychological obstacles to getting the 9-11 truth out is that people have a number of reasons and defenses for not wanting to believe. To accept that a secret part of our own government, that is the government that's supposed to protect us, will kill us, greatly reduces a sense of security. It's scary, even terrifying. They don't want to go there, they don't want to think about it, or hear about it. And what's most productive is to respond with empathy and understanding. And so what I'll be speaking about today is to increase our understanding so that we can feel more compassion and empathy for those that we're trying to reach with this information. So in my article, I start with um, a phenomenon known as the big lie, which I didn't know about 9-11, but as I was, um, was I, as I was starting my research in the days right after the event, I, uh, became fairly convinced very quickly because I was familiar with a lot of other things that were similar enough, like the Kennedy assassination and a number of other things that made me uh, pretty open to the information. I wasn't, uh, I didn't have a lot of resistance to it. But I had enough resistance that it took two solid months of research to be, to get to the point of being totally convinced. And I discovered later that my resistance was this one that I'm calling here the big lie. And that uh, the thing that turned the corner for me was learning about the alternative version of Pearl Harbor. That Pearl Harbor was not a surprise attack. And that, uh, and of course, that fact was covered up rather effectively for many years. And so the magnitude of it and the audacity of it, uh, it was sufficient that I that I was able to uh, finally be fully convinced. And I got a couple quotes that apply to that one. Uh, An individual is handicapped by coming face to face with a conspiracy so monstrous he cannot believe it exists. Another one, the masses indulge in petty falsehoods every day, but it wouldn't come into their heads to fabricate colossal untruths. The bigger the lie, therefore, the likelier it is to be believed. Now, as I said, that was sort of my resistance. It was just such a colossal, audacious thing to consider that, that people would try to do something like 9-11 in broad daylight and, and think they could get away with it. But when I discovered that about Pearl Harbor, that was sort of the final straw for me. And then it was, okay, now what am I gonna do about this? Now, another major resistance has to do with this idea that uh, it was a major, it's a major paradigm shift, a major think, uh, change in thinking to, uh, to accept 9-11 truth. So by questioning the official story, we were questioning the foundations of ourselves and many of our fellow citizens' belief systems regarding the government our country, and our country. Such questioning of our worldview, of our foundational beliefs, is profoundly disturbing. It's a major paradigm shift. To question the official, the official myth of 9-11 is fundamentally revolutionary. As such, it risks a period of chaos, which many find scary and disturbing. Change requires things be shaken up. It's a, it, whether it's positive change or negative change, there is always chaos involved, and we tend to think of chaos in an only negative sense, kind of the dark side of chaos, which, is, which can be destructive. 
But there's another thing called light chaos, which is the chaos that's involved, for instance, with creativity, that you have to have some uncertainty and some unknown um, in order to truly be creative. And so uh, we have to come to peace with that and realize that the chaos that our world is in is a, a, a potential for positive change. And of course, questioning the official story is deeply patriotic in the best sense of that word. So again, just to review a couple of these quotes in terms of this idea of paradigm shift and having our world turned upside down, you see that in, in two of these quotes where they mention specifically up is down and, and so forth. Now another concept that gets in the way is this idea of what's called nationalist faith. Now this particular concept, 9-11 um, truth is a confrontation to the self-image that many Americans have of their country. And, and, see the, and, and see of themselves as, as Americans. The self-image Americans have been sold is that we're the good guys, we're the white hats, and we're the bringers of democracy and freedom all over the world. And uh, David Ray Griffin uh, produced a DVD uh, shot in Denver called 9-11 and Nationalist Faith. I highly recommend it. And uh, he covers this concept uh, better than I will today. But um, the post 9-11 issues, such as the Iraq war with its weapons of mass destruction lies, the torture, the Katrina response, uh, the economic crisis, these are all helping to break down this self-image that Americans have and therefore are doorways to 9-11 truth, making our job effectively easier. And of all of them, I find that the lies leading to the Iraq war is really probably the most effective single comparison to make. Um, saying things like, well, the people we're thinking might have been involved with 9-11 are the same people that lied to us about Iraq and went in there and have killed a million people. So is it really so uh, outrageous to say that they might have been involved also in 9-11, which is the thing that enabled the war in Iraq? I don't think any of those lies would have worked had it not been in, in a post-9-11 world. Then there's a, the issue of questioning authorities in general. And um, a book uh, that I'd like to quote from put forth the following. The, quote, the book's called As If We Were Grown-Ups. The author's assertion is that we constantly elect candidates who tell, us, who tell us what children would want to hear. And what do children want to hear? Well, they want to hear that everything's okay, that little is required of them as citizens that they can go out and shop and play and watch sports or, rea or reality TV, and that they will be taken care of and protected. In exchange, they are expected to be seen and not heard, to pay their taxes, to take their flu shots, and to not question questionable authority. And this is actually a parent-child kind of relationship to have with an authority, where you're giving your power away to that authority. You're saying, you know, daddy, take care of me, and I'll be good. And uh, this is something uh, that we're up against as we, as we deal with this in ourselves and, and other people that, um, that is part of our world. But it's something that's changing because, again, there's so many things that have gone wrong and there's so many problems that people are, it's sort of forcing us all to grow up. A crisis can be an opportunity. And then there's this problem with um, feeling naive and gullible. And I start with this quote from Carl Sagan, who said, one of the saddest lessons of history is this. If we've been bamboozled long enough, we tend to reject any evidence of the bamboozle. We're no longer interested in finding out the truth. The bamboozle has captured us. It is simply too painful to acknowledge, even to ourselves, that we've been so credulous, so gullible for so long. And as we now stand, um, uh, what, close to 11 years uh, after the event, or more than 11, uh, anyone we're inducing, uh, introducing to the 9-11 truth issue at this point has believed the official story for many years. To accept 9-11 truth, they have to admit they were duped, deceived, and manipulated for all that time. That brings up issues of gullibility, naivete, a, f a lack of perceptiveness, obliviousness, and these, these kinds of uh, resistances. Most of us are kind of reluctant to admit to being gullible uh, and naive. 
those of us did not get 9-11 right away, which is most of us, have valuable knowledge about the psychological resistance we now, now face in others. They're the same type of resistances. In other words, except for the few people here, and there's always a few in the audience. Uh, in fact, let's just find out how many people were very suspicious about what happened on 9-11 on the day itself. Whoa, it was a pretty informed crowd. Okay, I feel like I'm in California. I get that reaction there, but not everywhere. Um, the point of the re is the rest of us did not, and even th those of us that did have some suspicions on the day didn't necessarily make the other assumption. And, and, and all of us that didn't, we, have our own, we had our own resistances, and by looking at what our resistances were, we can use those to be more compassionate and empathetic with people we're talking to because they, we can say, well, you know, I used to feel that way too, and I, I had the same kind of uh, problem when I first confronted this information. So we have emotional investments and ego investment. Uh, we're often emotionally invested in a worldview as, uh, as well as specific beliefs. We get emotional and biochemical rewards, payoffs for believing certain things and having to give up and have to give up that payoff in order to change the belief. So for instance, um, when we're presented with information that we already know we actually get the reward center in our brain is triggered. And by contrast, when we're presented with information we don't know, or that, which questions things we think we know, uh, the brain reacts very differently, and I'll talk about that more in a minute. There's also uh, ego, ego investment, where we get ego strokes, a sense of better than, by holding certain beliefs, and self-esteem issues can also be involved. So many different psychological aspects to 9-11 truth issues. And a big one um, is this idea of implications, and I like to call it the, the rabbit hole effect. Uh, you go down the rabbit hole, so to believe 9-11 truth, one has to believe many other rabbit hole types of things, things like that our media is corrupt and, and complicit, that there's a powerful shadow government, and that some of our leaders are more corrupt and malicious than we want to believe. It all comes with the package of 9-11 truth. And that is also, uh, as, as more and more things uh, happen in our world, is, is also being broken down. And again, the Iraq war lie is probably one of the most significant in breaking down uh, people's uh, resistance to some of these things because, for instance, they're aware that the mainstream corporate media uh, supported the lies that led us into Iraq. So people are much less trusting of corporate media. And then there's this issue of apathy and complacency. Um, which is um, uh, very common in this country and is encouraged by the media, by government, healthcare, and so forth. We're, we're actually encouraged to be apathetic. Uh, we're told that in a democracy, your job is to vote. And maybe once every four years or maybe once every two if you're really gung-ho. Uh, the idea that democracy is, a, uh, is not a spectator sport um, is, is not something that we're encouraged about. And it means that based on results, most people conclude the average U U.S. citizen does not act like they believe the following two quotes. The only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. And the price of freedom is eternal vigilance. And part of the resistance to 9-11 truth is that if we were to find out it was true, we might have to do something about it. And apathy and complacency get in the way of, of taking action. And this is a quote, uh, most people prefer to believe their leaders are just and fair, and even in the face of evidence to the contrary, because once a citizen acknowledges the government under which they live is lying and corrupt, the citizen has to choose what he or she will do about it. To take action in the face of a corrupt government entails risks of harm to life and loved ones. To choose to do nothing is to, choose, is to surrender one's self-image of standing up for principles. Most people do not have the courage to face that choice. Hence, most propaganda is not designed to fool the critical thinker, but only to give moral cowards an excuse not to think at all.
And another uh, effect of the PSYOP of 9-11, what it's done to our, most people in this country is that we're all essentially um, suffering from post-traumatic stress to a certain degree. Post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD, is a psychiatric disorder that can occur following the experiencing or witnessing of life-threatening events such as military combat, natural disasters, terrorist incidents, serious accidents, or violent personal assaults. People who suffer from PTSD often relieve the experience, relive the experience through nightmares and flashbacks and have difficulty sleeping, feel detached or estranged, and these symptoms can be severe enough and last long enough to significantly impair uh, a person's daily life. And of course, we're seeing so much of this from soldiers returning from the 9-11 the wars. After 9-11, there was a spike in PTSD, particularly in New York City. In some sense, many Americans experienced some level of PTSD after 9-11, and many still do. Thus, there is an increased sensitivity. So, um, canaries uh, have in the past been used in coal mines to warn as an early warning system. Odorless toxic gases such as carbon monoxide and methane in the mine would kill a bird before affecting the miners. Also because canaries tend to sing much of the time, they provided both a visual and audio audible cue in this respect. Use of canaries in mines was phased out as recently as 1986. Um, Probably, and probably having been replaced with mechanical gas detectors. So within our movement and within people we know, there are people that are more sensitive and that serve as canaries. And, and one of them was uh, a friend of mine, Jeanette McKinley, who was 9-11 truth activist and uh, actually a neighbor of mine in Oakland, California. And uh, one of her primary messages to our movement when she would speak at conferences was to be more sensitive in the way we pre present this information uh, because of the kind of impact it has on people because of they are suffering from uh, some degree of post-traumatic stress. And then I concluded uh, the article saying the following. These are some of the major reasons why so many people resist 9-11 truth. By understanding them, we can meet people with empathy and understanding and have more patience with them. Patience is so important because for most, awakening to the truth of 9-11 is a gradual process. It often takes weeks, months, or even years. In light of that, try to be sensitive when presenting evidence so as to notice when a person is full, when they've heard enough for the moment and need space to digest and absorb the new and often disturbing concepts. The truth alone is not enough, but the truth plus strategic thinking planning and education is enough to convince most fence sitters. Uh, as David Hutton, author of The Change Agents Handbook says, you do not have to spend a lot of time and effort on those who strongly resist change. You only have to help and protect those who want to change. Understanding the various emotional obstacles is an essential part of a strategy. Now, according to polls and various uh, information we have, Roughly one quarter of this country is resistant to practically anything that will result in the positive changes we're after. For instance, uh, nearly that many people still believe that there were weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. Uh, don't waste your time on those people because they're never going to get 9-11 truth. They'll go to their grave believing the official story. Just just move on, and uh, there's the other three quarters of the people that uh, are more open and more willing to, to hear what we have to say. So now I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, the media, since it's a, such an important part of covering up various uh, issues like 9-11 truth or selling wars. And it's important to refer to the media as corporate media. It's, people often call it mainstream media. Well, that's too benign a, a, a term, and it's not descriptive enough. It's corporate media. All the mainstream media is corporate, and therefore serves a corporate agenda. 
And the same corporations that own that media own the, the corporations that build weapons of war. And therefore, they benefit to the tune of trillions of dollars from war. So they're not going to be, uh, they're going to support these wars. They're going to encourage these wars. And they're going to continue to deceive us about wars. So we have to wean ourselves off of mainstream corporate media. Uh, we want to keep track of what's there because that's what we know other citizens are, are seeing and reading and hearing. But we have to know that you're not getting the whole truth. And sometimes you're getting total lies. And uh, fortunately, we now have the internet. And there are many, many places to get better sources of news. Uh, unfortunately, it takes a lot of discernment because everything's on the web. But that's our job now is to, uh, to work more with alternative media. But in terms of uh, the, the corporate media, questions arise besides the, the money aspect of why the media is so much of a megaphone for lies and, and deception. And here's one answer. This is a quote from William Colby, the former director of the CIA, saying that the Central Intelligence Agency, the CIA, owns everyone of significance in the major media. They own them. In other words, at the top of every major corporate organization, be it television, newspapers, whatever, there's one or more people that are, in a sense, working for the CIA and making sure that the message goes out that is consistent with what the military and com industrial complex wants. I love the subtitle. This actually appeared on TV. Here's another little quote from George Bush. See, in my line of work, you got to keep repeating things over and over again for the truth to sink in, to kind of catapult the propaganda. George was never that subtle, was he? And if you want to know a little more about our, our corporate media, uh, if you haven't already, Google Mo Operation Mockingbird started in the early days of the Cold War in the late 40s. The CIA began a secret pro project called Operation Mockingbird with the intent of buying influence behind the scenes at major media outlets and putting reporters on the CIA payroll, which was evaluated shortly a few years after it started as a stunning success. And you think about it, uh, reporters are perfect people to be spies because their job is to go out and get, gather information. And they do it internationally. The CIA effort to recruit American news organizations and journalists to become spies and disseminators of propaganda was headed by, well, some of the usual suspects. And uh, back to Ed, Edward Bernays. We can't, can't neglect him too long. As the father of public relations, he pioneered the PR industry, the use of psychology and other social sciences uh, to design its public persuasion campaigns. Brene drew upon his uncle Freud's psychoanalytical ideas for the benefit of commerce in order to promote commodities as diverse as cigarettes, soap, and books. Okay, so one, another aspect of this I want to emphasize is that we have to look at ourselves. Working to change the world without also doing the inner work of changing and healing ourselves and our personal relationships is far less effective and efficient. In other words, as Gandhi and others have said, we have to be the change we want to create. And one way to define that uh, comes from one of the people that was in the movie, uh, uh, What the Bleep, do we know? How, how many people saw that movie in theaters or in DVD? Okay, that's not enough of you. Okay, you gotta see this movie. <laughs> it's just really absolutely remarkable movie. And um, it, it sort of takes you, we're talking about going down the rabbit hole into kind of a lot of dark areas. Uh, the, the What the Bleep movie kind of takes you up the rat, rabbit hole into light areas. Um, and uh, more encouraging things that are going on. And part of it involves quantum physics. 
which is a little obscure to many, I know, but uh, the movie has a way of making the implications of quantum physics more understandable to the average person. So I recommend it highly. There's actually a sort of a sequel called uh, also What the Bleep, but the subtitles Down the Rabbit Hole. And uh, one of the people that serves a, that is in that movie, his name is uh, Amit Goswami, and he came up with this term quantum activism. And what he said about that was the distinction with ordinary activism is very important. In ordinary activism, we're trying to change the world while avoiding responsibility of changing ourselves. In quantum activism, we recognize that we are the world. Michael Jackson was right. <laughs> and that therefore, we not only try to change the world, but we also recognize it's impossible without also changing ourselves. So one little example of that that has been part of my presentation since the first uh, one of this, uh, which was in March of 2004, where um, as I was meeting a lot of activists from all over the country for the first time, and we were planning the day before uh, what we were gonna be doing, I noticed uh, amongst many people, they would be talking about uh, having a, a need of urgency of getting this information out. But what I was hearing was something else, which is panic. And so I decided, uh, oh, there we go, the rest of that slide. Uh, so I decided to add to my PowerPoint the night before I gave it um, something to, to educate about what's the difference between urgency and panic, and it went like this. Many of us feel a sense of urgency in getting the truth of 9-11 message out. This is driven by many things, and there is, as there are so many crises happening all at once now, this was in, again, 2004, and it's only gotten worse. But what many of us think is a healthy sense of urgency is often really a very different and far less comfortable emotion that's known as panic. Superficially, urgency and panic seem similar. So how do we know which is predominant, the predominant feeling in us at any one time? Well, we can start by comparing the two with a series of phrases and words that sort of describe these two emotions. Panic is a constrictive emotion and includes things like feeling exhausted and tense and worried and frantic. It's very stressful, we feel insecure. There's often this, this sense of ominously close deadlines. Oh, we've got to get this information out before. Before, before what? You know, it's like we're running out of time. Really? Running out of time? What an odd phrase. I think time just keeps going on. Um, but the point is there's a sense of panic. Uh, there's some nervousness, anxiety, it's often catastrophic thinking, oh, if we don't get this information out, this is more in 2004 than now, but there's still some of it. Um, if we don't get this information out fast, it'll be too late. Um, it's often worst case scenario, a sense of apprehension and foreboding, and you hear peppered through the talk of a panicked person, a lot of, we must do this, we need to do this, we have to do this, imperatives of various sorts. So it's a pretty terrified space to be in. By contrast, urgency is an expansive emotion and feels energizing and exciting. Worry is replaced with concern. We do feel secure enough. We have, feel that there is enough time. It's fun, it's interesting, it's exciting. We can remain calm and at peace even as we're very active. We can even be playful. And we subs instead of saying things like we must, we say things, well, we want to, or we'd like to, or we'd prefer to. It's not that sense of uh, demand to it. And we're more optimistic and happy. Now, I would suggest all of us feel both these emotions one time or another, and often a mixture of them. But if you're feeling anything in that left column, know that it's probably related to panic, and that there is an antidote. You can still have a sense of urgency uh, without feeling so um, stressed. And the reason I've kept this particular one in my PowerPoint is the feedback was that this was the most interesting, useful, helpful information of the whole presentation. So, okay, we'll keep going. And now time for a little comic relief. The king of the salesmen, the caption for this cartoon. Um, 
this guy has apparently been successful at selling refrigerators to Eskimos and therefore is the king of the salesmen. I put this in here because in a sense that's sort of what we were trying to do as 9-11 truth activists. We're trying to sell people something they don't really want, they're not interested in. Um, so we have to also be sort of good at sales and, and that's part of why it's important to understand what the problem is and what we're up against. Now, in recent years, there's been a lot of research on the brain um, benefited by uh, MRI studies. And this particular article I'm quoting here is talking about um, the partisan thought, the liberals versus the conservative kind of divide, and what goes on in the brain, and says that liberals and conservatives can become equally bug-eyed and irrational when talking politics. Using MRI scanners, neurosciences have now tracked what happens in the politically partisan brain. The process is almost entirely emotional and unconscious, the researchers report. The cold reasoning re uh, regions of the cortex are relatively quiet. That's why most debates between partisan debates don't really accomplish much because uh, we're not really thinking, we're reacting. And, it, and um, Researchers have long known that political decisions are strongly influenced by unconscious emotional reactions, a fact routinely exploited by campaign consultants and advertisers. But the new research suggests that for partisans, political thinking is often predominantly emotional. Democrats and Republicans alike are adept at making decisions without letting the facts get in their way. Now again, this is talking about partisan thought, but it turns out this applies to all sorts of things in life. And it certainly dis, dis, uh, applies most significantly when people are presented with the cognitive dissonance, the, the stress, the anxiety, the problems that come up when you suggest to them that the official story of 9-11 might not be true. And what we've learned is this, uh, from, from similar studies using MRI. Here's the M a MRI machine, magnetic resonance imaging. And it comes down to this. If you try to tell somebody that the Twin Towers were brought down by controlled demolition, you will trigger fight and flight reactions in them because they already know what happened to the Twin Towers. They know the Twin Towers fell down because of the planes and the fires. So you've now created a dissonance, a problem of conflict within them you're trying to change a belief they already hold. And the two are, there's a war going on in the brain and the brain lights up and it lights up in the fight or flight sections. And therefore there's hostility, there's fear, there's fight, flight or freeze. Um, there, there are these various emotional reactions and they're not necessarily gonna hear what you're trying to say about the towers and why they look like they're an explosion it, it, because they're in fight or flight. On the other hand, if you talk to them about Building 7, most people have never heard of it, have no idea that it even existed or that it fell on 9-11, or why. As a result, the brain responds in a profoundly different way. Instead of fight or flight, you now have lit up the cortex because they're now curious and interested about what you're saying, and now they are listening and they want to hear what you're saying because you're presenting something that doesn't conflict with their current thinking. And that's why it's so important when starting with anybody new and fresh to this topic to present information that's new and does not conflict with what they already think they know. And Building 7 is our gift. It is the issue of all the issues involved with the 9-11 Truth Movement that is outside of what they already know. It was so covered up um, by the official report that people have not even heard of it. So skip the Twin Towers till later. Just start with Building 7 and you'll get a lot further a lot faster. Now a related issue is uh, I recommend the work of George Lakoff who has for years been uh, kind of a, on the liberal side of the equation in terms of trying to get uh, more progressive people to to do the same thing conservatives have been doing for years, where they funded uh, to the tune of millions of dollars various think tanks 
and made heavy investments in the ideas and in language and how to language events and that's where these Orwellian things like Clear Skies initiatives which is about more pollution and Healthy Forest initiatives which is about deforestation and of course the always popular War on Terror. These come from these think tanks who, are, who do have a lot of psychologists and psychiatrists and do understand this idea of framing and how it works and that's something we need to learn in order to level the playing field. Now, an example of how that might work on a practical level, how we present ourselves as a movement. This is a subtle one, but I think it's uh, worth considering. Various people refer to either 911 truth or 911 truth. And because of the fact that 911 is the emergency phone number that triggers fear responses and anxiety and so forth. 9-11 is just a date, and even though it has some charge on it now too, it doesn't have the same charge as 9-11. So I strongly recommend that we never refer to 9-11 as 9-11, either in text or in, in speech, because it's handicapping ourselves. We're not using these ideas of framing and language to our advantage, we're, us letting, we're using it to our disadvantage. Besides, it's also grammatically correct. It is a date, and dates are written with a slash or dash. So we're always trying to build this movement, right? We're trying to get more people to events like this and to look at our videos and, and uh, read the books and so forth. So how can we reach more people with our message? How can we attract more people with, to, uh, within, uh, to, within our movement? And what psychological factors explain why our movement is kind of imbalanced, why we have, say, mostly men and fewer women? including here today, it's, it's always this way. Now there's many reasons for that, and there's nothing wrong about it, it's just that men's and women's brains are actually very different. We think different, we process information differently, and it's only natural that there would be more men than women. But there's some factors that we can, we can do something about in terms of presenting our information uh, in ways that will be more attractive and get more not just women, but also men that are more sensitive. And so um, what I've done here is I've created a contrast of a con what's actually a continuum uh, where, and I'm using the words hardy and sensitive, and I'll define what I mean by those. But basically, um, we know that the 9-11 truth movement tends to attract more hardy individuals and scare away more sensitive folks. So what are we talking about? Well, hardy people, tend to be strong, substantial, boisterous, vigorous, spirited, forceful, vital, enthusiastic, dynamic, unrestrained, loud, and energetic. Sensitive people are responsive, perceptive, open, and usually re responsive to and affected by exter particular external stimuli. They're sympathetic in relation to the feelings of others, and they need to be dealt with more, more tactfully. Now, women tend to be a little more on the sensitive side. Men tend to be a little more on the health, the hardy side, but it's not a man-woman thing. It's a, it's a difference in personality, and it shows up sort of like this. Alex Jones tends to speak rather loudly, <laughs> and it's a little too much for sensitive people. They just don't regardless of what he's saying, it's his approach, the way he presents is just too loud and too aggressive for a lot of sensitive people. Other people, hardy people, love it. David Ray Griffin, by contrast, is very uh, calm and, and uh, restrained and uh, he's more, more able to speak to sensitive people. However, people in the Alex Jones camp are, are often will say, well, yeah, but David Ray Griffin puts me to sleep. So different strokes for different folks. The point is, who are you talking to? What's their style? And try to match their style so that they can hear better. And if particularly if they're sensitive, try to tone it down. Um, if they're hardy, they'll probably be okay with the sensitive as long as they don't fall asleep. Sensitive approach. And here's, a, here's an example of how that looks. Uh, if you're going to package up a DVD and you want people to pick it up and buy it, uh, you have two different approaches. The hardy approach, 
and the sensitive approach. So this, this uh, by the way, it was uh, Alex Jones that repackaged the <laughs> myth and reality <laughs> with the packaging on the left. And uh, you know, for the people like Alex Jones, that's probably fine. But uh, I would suggest that a little more universal appeal would be the one that I chose for the, for the DVD. Okay, another place that uh, these emotional differences show up within our movement and the work that we do is how we look at evidence, particularly new evidence that comes along, um, and how we evaluate it. We like to think we use only rational thinking when we're examining and evaluating various theories, but psychological and emotion fact factors also affect our thinking. So what's that look like? Well, I've broken this down into two categories, again, and I'm calling them conventional and exotic. Okay, so conventional would be, you know, buildings were brought down by controlled demolition. That's how buildings are conventionally brought down. More exotic would be the buildings were brought down by energy weapons from space. So here's some words. Conventional, conservative, conformist, straight, square, predictable, unadventurous, boring, ordinary, controlled demolition, big deal. But on the other hand, exotic, unusual, out of the ordinary, striking, bizarre, mysterious, glamorous, colorful, outlandish, strange, exciting, and stimulating. The point being that um, if we're going to be truly objective and rational in evaluating more exotic theories, we have to recognize and neutralize the emotional appeal of the more exotic and be willing to work with the conventional and familiar despite its comparative lack of emotional appeal. In other words, we need to level the playing field between these two categories of theories in order to be more objective. Now, related to this is the idea of novelty. Our brains are work in such a way that we like novelty, we like new stuff. It's interesting, it's not boring. And so as new theories come along, keep that in mind. This is, you know, the, the new theory du jour, the new theory that's novel. It's gonna catch our attention. Now, it may be valid, not, not to say we don't need to evaluate every theory that comes along, but keep in mind what part of the brains are functioning and our brains are functioning and, and how, um, we can be thrown off at least temporarily by the new and the novel until it's no longer novel, at which point you look at it and you go, wait a minute, that's crazy. Now I'd like to talk for a few minutes about alternative media uh, because I'm a media guy and I produce media and there's a lot of good media out there and I wanna make sure you all know about some of the great new media that's come along or in some of the stuff that's been around for a while um, so that you can further your own education in these areas. Um, there's a classic uh, from Adam Curtis called The Century of Self. I bet you a lot of people have seen that. How many people have seen that particular DVD? Oh, that's not enough hands. Okay, um, you might want to check that out. It's available online. It's on DVD and so forth. Um, there's a, also a movie version of the Manufacturing consent, consent, which is definitely worth checking out. And this, uh, this one comes in various packaging. Uh, and apparently there's a book version and a DVD version. And uh, it's just important because this idea of manipulating people, again, we're back to uh, Eddie Bernays and, and the idea of manipulating uh, the people through forms of psychological mind control, also known as advertising. Now, I speak about these things partly because uh, one of the groups I represent is the Northern California 9-11 Truth Alliance from the Bay Area, which I helped found. And uh, we've done many events over the years, including uh, for the last, I think it's seven or eight years, I've lost count. Uh, we do an annual event on the anniversary at the Grand Lake Theater in Oakland, where I now live. And uh, we uh, do it all all day event, to one in the afternoon till 11 at night. And uh, yeah, you think this event's long. <laughs> and uh, we show a lot of films, we also have speakers. And um, so some of the films in, uh, that I wanna mention have been shown uh, to our audiences there in the Bay Area to three, 400 people at a time. 
and uh, have gotten very good feedback, so I want you to know about them. Now, there's one that we showed last year called A Noble Lie, and it's about the um, Oklahoma City bombings in 1995, and it's a very good documentary. Strongly recommend seeing it. Um, and reveals that much of what we believe to be true on, about that event was deliberate deception. Um, then there's this new, um, this new film that's just come out, which isn't even released till the 17th of this month, so all I can do is give you the information they give you, but it's from the same people that did this prior excellent documentary, and we may well show it at the Grand Lake Theater this September 11th, so come on down and and uh, join us for a, a full day. Um, so this film, uh, they say, um, re uh, state of mind reveals that much of what we believe to be true is actually deliberate deception. The global elites are systematically implanting lies in our consciousness to erect a tyranny over the minds of men. This film exposes the mind control methods being used. You can tell by the verbiage here, this is for hardy people, but here we go. So, are we controlled? To what extent and by whom? And what does it mean for humanity's future? From cradle to grave, our parents, peers, and institutions, institutions and society inform our values and behaviors, but this process has been hijacked. State of mind examines the science of control that has evolved over generations to keep us firmly in place so that dictators, power brokers, and corporate puppeteers may profit from our ignorance and slavery. From compulsory scrolling to media and entertainment, we are controlled by the ideas that shape our actions. So, sounds like a good film. I'm gonna see it, recommend it. Uh, one you can check out right now, if you're interested, is one that came out a few years ago, which we also showed at the Grand Lake, called Psy Wars, a documentary on propaganda. Um, it's a documentary about propaganda it touches on historical elements with regard to PR, Edward Bernays, media, war, politics, and democracy, as similarly presented in Adam Curtis's The Century of the Self or Manufacturing Consent with, consent with uh, Noam Chomsky. One, another one we showed last year was called I Am Fishhead, How Psychopaths and Antidepressants Influence Our Society. What's wrong with our world? This is a film for people who want to know. Every meaningful change starts with awareness. In our culture, we not only praise psychopaths in the highest positions of power, but in some cases they become our role models. Challenge your beliefs. Now basically what this film is saying, and it's based on a number of books, including particularly the one in the middle, Snakes and Suits, When Psychopaths Go to Work, is that our concept, our commonly held concept of what a psychopath is, is not very accurate. We get these images from movies that, you know, there's some kind of murderous monsters and so forth. It turns out that in many studies that a small percentage of the population are functioning psychopaths. And the characteristic of them is that they lack the ability to feel the emotion called remorse, which is the aspect of shame that we feel when we hurt another person. And when, when we're growing up, when we're, we're uh, learning how to be a little human, and you know, maybe we hit our little sister and she cries, healthy shame shows up as remorse and genuine sorrow, you know, where we're sorry that we hurt that person. And most of us are capable of feeling that. But a very small percentage of people are not. Something has happened to them uh, in their upbringing. It's a combination of nature and nurture. So there's some DNA that is, uh, cap is uh, creates a predisposition, but it requires the nurture part of the equation of some kind of uh, generally a very abusive upbringing in order to trigger that, that particular epigenetic switch. If you don't know epigenetics, look it up. You gotta know about that. Um, and therefore, the person eventually uh, basically becomes twisted and broken, and you can actually see it in the structure of the brain. Psychopaths that have been, had their brains dissected, 
It's actually a difference in the brain structure. There's also a difference in the chemistry of the brain. There's certain chemicals in the brain that are very different in different proportions than a healthy person. Um, the point is that they're not unable to feel remorse, which means they also generally lack empathy and compassion, and therefore they're able to hurt people repeatedly and without any, without a problem. The problem isn't so much that these people exist, it's that we live in a society that is hierarchical in nature. Every institution, virtually every institution, whether it's the military, the government, corporations, they're all hierarchies, they're all pyramids of control. And people that are ruthless tend to move up hierarchies quicker and more completely faster than people that have more of a moral compass. And so our world is to an extent literally run by psychopaths in the government, in the military, and in corporations, the major institutions of our world. That is the problem. And the, so what we need to do is learn about this, change our thinking, get educated so that we can learn to recognize this phenomenon in our world and in, in, in people we know. Because right now, as, as was mentioned in the film, you know, we actually, there, there's literally psychopaths that are role models in our world. And this is obviously a problem. So I recommend the movie Fishhead. I'm not crazy about the style of the film. It's a little too gimmicky. So when you watch it and all the little gimmicky fishes come up, I warned you. Watch the film anyway. Excellent film. Uh, as are, I assume, these books, which I have not read, by the way. Um, by the way, the one, uh, this last one, political pulmonology, is kind of a classic in the field. Uh, okay, how many people have seen the film, The Corporation? Uh, glad a few of you have, and again, that's not enough hands. Uh, this is an extremely important film to see. To, again, to understand how our world works so that we can find ways to change it. And in The Corporation, they explore the nature of the spectacular rise of the dominant institution of our time, taking its legal status as a person to its logical conclusion, the film puts the corporation on the psychiatric, uh, psychiatrist's couch to ask, what kind of person is it? The conclusion, corporations behave like psychopaths. Well, so now we've got institutions that are psychopathic by nature run by psychopaths. This is a problem. So I strongly recommend this film um, it, it, to me, it should be required viewing in every school and by every person to understand because the, it is the dominant. It, it, corporations do now rule the world much more than governments. And so we have to understand this monster that we've created uh, because so we can uncreate it or change it in such a way that it can no longer dominate uh, world events. Now, a newer movie that came out is also al almost sort of like a sequel to uh, the corporation called Heist, Who Stole the American Dream, traces the world economic collapse to a 1971 secret memo entitled Attack on American Free Enterprise System, written over 40 years ago by the future Supreme Court Justice, Lewis Powell, at the behest of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. The six-page memo, a free market utopian treaty, treaties uh, calls for a money-fueled big business makeover of government through corporate control of the media, academia, the pulpit, the arts and sciences, and destruction of organized labor and consumer protection groups. So apparently a lot of this traces its origins to this 1971 memo. Um, they go on to say, the end game was a business, was business control of law and politics. Heist, ex Heist exposes the systematic implementation of the Powell Memo by both U.S. political parties, culminating in the deregulation of industry, outsourcing of jobs, regress and regressive taxation, all of, all of which led us to the global financial crisis of 2008, 
and the continued dismantling of the American middle class. Today, politics is the playground of the rich and famous with no thought given to ordinary Americans. ICE provides viewers with a fact-based explanation of how we got in this mess and what we need to do to restore our representative democracy. Now this film, uh, I first just, I'd heard about it, I, it was played on um, uh, actually a couple networks, uh, one of them being RT, Russia Today, which turns out to be not only on the internet, but is, um, I, I get my media through the DISH network, and it's on DISH, I discovered recently. So I was, re, uh, was recording some of the shows, the news shows they have, because one of the newscasters is Abby Martin, who's a 9-11 truther from San Diego. We're infiltrating the media. Uh, well, Russian media anyway, but Russia Today has American uh, US-based um, uh, news. And um, so I was recording the show and found Heist Part One. It's two-hour movie, and this was the first half hour, and watched it, and I'm like, oh my God, I gotta, I gotta talk about this film. So I actually haven't seen the other three quarters, but I'm looking forward to it. Um, and it's, uh, as I say, it's on some, uh, some cable networks, but it's available. So I recommend that one highly. Another film and organization that I strongly recommend that you've probably not heard of, I'll ask for a show of hands, is called Thrive. Uh, anyone familiar with this film? One, two, three, four, half a dozen of you. Okay, um, you're excused on this one. This is a little more obscure, but it's incredibly uh, powerful. I strongly recommend it. Um, and again, all this stuff, just go to these websites at the bottom. Thrive is a documentary that lifts the veil, the veil on what's really going on in our world by following the money upstream, uncovering the global consolidation of power in nearly every aspect of our lives. Weaving together breakthroughs in science, consciousness, and activism, Thrive offers real solutions, empowering us with unprecedented and bold strategies for reclaiming our lives and our future. Now what's happened is that the people that made this film put together a monumental website so that as soon as the film was out, the website would be ready to go with, again, all kinds of solutions. And, and the thinking and the work there is extraordinary. I strongly recommend go to this website tonight, get the film, watch it, share it. It's a very powerful film. It mentions 9-11 Truth only briefly in terms of Building 7, but it's a very full film, and uh, I think you'll probably get a lot out of it. I also want to highlight a few um, things going on in the 9-11 Truth movement that not everybody is, uh, knows about. One thing you do know about, because you just saw it, is um, this new movement, which of course fits perfectly with, with what I've been saying about presenting Building 7 as, as the leading edge of any approach to 9-11 truth, because again, the, the brain doesn't go into fight, flight, or freeze mode and is open to it. So I strongly endorse any, any uh, actions of this kind, because they can be more effective. There's also a uh, fairly new organization called Consensus 9-11. How, how many people know about Consensus 9-11? Okay, so this is news to most of you. 24 member 9-11 uh, Consensus Panel is building a body of evidence-based research regarding the events of September 11th. This evidence derived from a standard scientific reviewing process is available to any investigation that may, may be undertaken by the public, the media, academia, or any other investigative body or institution. The panel regularly features selected excerpts from their consensus points with links to full supporting documentation. So David Ray Griffin is one of the founders of this organization. Um, many people like Richard Gage involved with it a very good way to get the information that is most reliable, most solid, most defendable with documentation uh, as a way to uh, make a, a better case for what we're wanting to say. I strongly recommend uh, going to their website. On a somewhat similar note, um, a couple years ago up in Toronto, the Toronto hearings, how, how many people knew about the Toronto hearings? 
That's a few more hands, good. Um, this was a several days event with some of our very best uh, people, including David Ray Griffin and, and uh, Richard Gage. And uh, they did release a DVD that's five and a half hours long, a bit much for some people. Uh, we wanted to present it at the Grand Lake Theater last year, and so I was tasked with condensing that five and a half hours down to a short enough time that we could show it, and uh, ended up at 65 minutes, and that's available. Um, and it, but the whole five and a half hours is available, as is a, now a print report. And again, uh, with possibly one exception, is some of the best, most solid information, very professionally presented to a panel of experts, which then made uh, rulings, just like a, a court. Uh, it was a very uh, well-structured hearing. And one more I want to talk about is the Journal of 9-11 Studies. Again, a show of hands. How many are familiar with, with this journal and, and the website and what's going on? Okay, um, the journal 9-11 study is peer-reviewed, electronic-only journal covering research related to the events of 9 September 11. Many fields of study are represented, and all content is freely available online. Over 60 peer-reviewed articles are available. Now, part of what's so exciting this a bit, to me about this is that this is not just people arguing over you know, what did or didn't hit the Pentagon or various things that we argue about endlessly because we have our opinions and we're doing a, basically a partisan debate. You know, the rational side shut down, we're just arguing. Um, the Journal 9-11 Studies, because it represents a lot of uh, scientists and engineers and, and other scholars who are familiar with uh, how to approach information in a more objective way, um, have written a series of academic papers, of, of very well written papers that are peer reviewed and um, avoid the emotional uh, pitfalls and, and just work with the information. And uh, for instance, there are three papers on uh, the, the eternal question of what did or didn't hit the Pentagon. And most of us aren't familiar with it and it's really uh, unfortunate and I hope uh, today I'm, I'm changing that because uh, it, we really need to look at these things more emotionally and uh, less emotionally and more objectively and more rationally in order to actually figure out what happened. And in my experience uh, in, in the movement, uh, when questions like, you know, what hit the Pentagon come up, it, it really isn't a rational discussion. So I strongly uh, uh, urge you to check out this, to use it as a reference for people you're trying to talk to that are, are interested in really a more rational approach to things, and to also inform yourself about some of the things that we, mysteries that we still haven't solved and are still wondering about. Now Project Censored uh, is a uh, media organization which looks to reverse the impact of corporate media, and um, I strongly recommend uh, their work, and they do cover 9-11 Truth and have for years, and um, they're, uh, they produce a book and a list of stories each year. They work with universities. Very good organization. Um, very much worth checking out and knowing about. Um, I mentioned uh, the problem with partisan uh, politics. Um, part of the solution to that is this idea of transpartisan, of getting, getting away from this left-right divide that's often uh, just a way to keep people powerless, divided and conquered, right? Um, and uh, this book, which is an e-book available online for free, um, is, is an approach to this. Uh, I attended a conference with, on this subject and uh, it's a way to get around um, the divisive thinking and, and start working more together um, against the real problems that we're facing. And being here in Portland, I can't not mention Portland Independent Media Center, um, because it's right here, and uh, they do very good work in many areas, including uh, the part of the, some of the pioneering work uh, and continuing work on 9-11 Truth. Okay, so uh, I mentioned that I was going to conclude with uh, some uh, one point from a, a, a longer talk I gave on the kind of the big picture and in context stuff. And um, 
And again, this was the description. I already read that of that talk. And there was a book that came out in the mid 90s called When Corporations Rule the World. Always kind of felt like the title said it all. You know, it's like, okay, I got it. <laughs> um, but anyway, the author who r did write a sequel to that book uh, then kind of took a step back and started looking deeper into what's going on really in our world that this could happen. And has since written a book called The Great Turning from Empire to Earth Community. And I want to read uh, just a couple quotes out of that. We humans live by stories, often mythologies. We are held captive to the ways of empire by a cultural trance of our own creation, maintained by stories that deny the higher possibilities of our human nature, including our capacities for compassion, cooperation, responsible self-direction, and self-organizing partnership. We can turn a potentially terminal crisis into an epic opportunity to bring forth a new era of Earth. Changing our future begins with changing our stories, a work already underway. And I add, like this changing the story of what happened on the day of 9-11. So, thank you very much. Um, we're gonna go straight into a Q&A. Um,